like uh, once, and I have to like do it like every single. But yeah, let's uh, jump straight into uh, my practice this week. So the fact is going to uh, right now, what I do is sometimes I find just like doing the whole day practice by just lying down. Um, sometimes that's a little too prone to like like falling asleep sometimes, especially after, like since I'm doing it like right after I come back from work. So what I try to do is I sit for 25 minutes in a chair, so when I'm like all nice and alert, around like 20, 25 minutes, I get up and I lie down and then I just continue to practice until the timer rings. Um, so there, there's not really anything like special to report from the formal practice, except that time that, you know, when I'm lying down, you know, it gets like really bright and like the mind is kind of still, which is nice. Um, but at other times, of course, uh, sometimes there will be times where I don't fully fall asleep, but I know that like my awareness fades because I, I, I come back and I immediately know that since I've forgotten something that happened, something must have faded. Or there are times where I black out, but immediately, right, on, right as I'm on the, like, black out, I come back with a sudden joy, like, oh, no, no, you, you should wake up, which is great. So I, I get kind of happy that the mind will, will, like, jolt me up like that. Um, and that's great. Um, the highlight um, of this week, I think, is, um, again, like, a very powerful reminder to, like, I think last time we discussed on, uh, basically to look at Dukkha and understand Dukkha. Uh, so I can probably tell a story that spanned the entire week. It hasn't happened. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, uh, I should probably start with this one. This is like the highlight of the entire week here. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I gotta like lower my voice a little bit because my parents and everybody else is like right outside the door. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. slow so, down a little too. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I gotta work on that. Yeah. Um, so what my uh, father is currently doing is uh, he's like a freelance like videographer. He helps people like take videos, and then he basically edits them, puts them onto a disc, and then he prints them out and all that stuff. And he basically charges them like a hundred or so for like a printed disc and all that stuff. So he's kind of like tech illiterate, uh, where you know when you, when you print something on the disc, you have to align the printers and all that stuff. And you know, like printers are expensive, right? They they charge like the ink that costs a lot more than the printer itself. Um, so what he's been doing is uh, he's been using like uh, I guess like cheap ink, like to replace the actual official ink in the printer. Um, yeah. It's cheaper, but it comes at a cost because it clogs up the printer. Um, so he like just ran out of ink at the beginning of the week, and so he was thinking about getting like cheap ink again. But the cheap ink is not so cheap now. Um, and it's actually the same price as the official ink. So my mother and I were like, you should use the official ink to avoid all these problems. And what he was like, what he said he, he, he what he said he would do was, okay, I'm just gonna like buy a new printer with all the ink. It'll, it'll include all the ink. I'll just buy a new printer. Um, now the problem with that is the like, printers it, are really cheap, and the, the ink that comes with printers that are new. Mm -hmm. uh, is a very reduced, only about 30%. Right. All right. It, it's crazy. The first thing that they want you to do is to use up the little bit of ink that comes with the printer so that you can uh, mm -hmm. uh, buy new ink. They want you to start buying new ink. That's where they make their money. Right. And no, but, but, uh, so I buying a new printer may not be the right thing because, in fact, if it's the printhead that clogs, mm -hmm. The expensive part is not the ink itself. The expensive part is the head. Ah, oh, the printer that head. Comes, the printer head that is uh, part of the package when you buy ink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is, is he using refill ink? Right. So he's using like like cheap like refill ink. But if you know, he's I using the refill ink, then there are things that you can do on the internet that, that can show you how to clean the heads. Mm -hmm. And one of them is is that on every one of those ink things is a switch. They mm -hmm. are a place 
you know, like on the back of a router or even on cell phones on some of them, there's a place to do a reset. Mm -hmm. You can actually reset every one of those heads. The, 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 the colored ink has three places to push or maybe just one, and the black one has a place to push, and a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> yeah, and so what he was basically doing... Um, so was, tell your story anyway. I've got yeah. more to say about printers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically he was like, you know, I'll just like return this printer and buy a new one. And he was like, I bought an extended warranty, so I'll just tell the guy, you know, it broke and I'll get a new one. Now, that wasn't, you know, I, I heard that and I was like, okay, that's kind of, mm. but the the real kicker to me is like, so every time he gets a new printer, I have to spend hours, like four or five hours, calibrate a new print, like printing templates that we have for the discs and everything. So when I, so when I heard him do this, say this, um, I think this was like late at night, I was like, Immediately, like I can sense anger, impatience. So I just flat out said, "Nope, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not doing this like a third time. I, I'm not doing this." And so basically, that thing escalated, and it turned into this huge thing. And and uh, basically, when he was like shouting at me and all that stuff like that, like so many elements uh, of Duga like that we observe, like the top <laughs> show up. But that's not the kicker. That's the appetizer. Um, so uh, basically, lo lots of things you know come up, and he's like, "Oh, he's angry that we're not helping him. That you know, I'm not shelling out the money for the new ink and all that stuff." But but there's more. Um, so after this thing, you know, he had to leave because he had a job coming up. So he comes back that night, just like doesn't talk to me. And so at at that, at that point, um, I said, "Okay, well, you know, I'll take a deep breath, and I can feel, of course, the physical like 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 the sensations of you know like the tension and everything." So I was like, all right, well, you know, like, I guess I could t take a deep breath and see how this goes. So basically, we just don't talk for like three, four days. Now, at the beginning, you know, uh, I, I'm fine with this. But as I, you know, as I uh, basically, mm, like over the, the the past three days, I see a lot of things. Um, so first of all, I understand, I finally see how it's like to basically, you know, I guess what people would call Stonewall. It is not a pleasant thing at all. It is a terrible thing. Um like the the extent of the the dukkha that leaks out, uh, even the, the, between the two of us, and it leaks out into the other people. It is a terrible thing, um, absolutely terrible. And so <laughs> I can understand how you know from his point of view, being isolated all the time, even for me, like three days, even with a, 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 a observance of how this works, you know, at times you can actually like sense a really strong negativity, and even with like you know say. Uh, I guess like taking a deep breath and all that. It's fine, but when you, you know, I, I don't hold as much of a, okay, there's lots of things I'm trying to like organize as I speak. So let, let me reorganize. So the first thing is, uh, I can observe, um, you know, the damage that the dukkha actually does, like this, these sensations leaks out to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. the thing is, I was also surprised at, uh, how often he rehearses his thoughts. I'm pretty sure in those three days, um, he had that same argument. How I didn't really have that because I, when as soon as I it, it comes, I take a deep breath and I let go of it. But even then, uh, I was surprised at how you know when he talks to me, the flash of anger can still come back, even though I don't hold it over three days. But when there's interaction, it comes back. So that was the second thing. Um, but then the third thing, which is like, um, you know, at first it's like the three days I was okay, but you know my mother of course starts breaking down and says, you know, you can't you can't do this, you know, can't fragment the family. And so that got me thinking, am I doing basically the same thing he is doing, right? By, by, I, I'm basically forming this habit of stonewalling. And so I was like, okay, mm -hmm. maybe I can something up. And so I made it a point to basically study um, the dukkha. Like to, to, to say, I said to myself, okay, let, let's talk to him. And, you know, um, let's study like the dukkha that comes up when I, when, when I talk to him. So I basically sat down and said, you know, let's have an honest conversation. Let, like... You know, I know that, you know, uh, when I flashed out a couple of days ago, it was inconsiderate. I didn't consider your point of view and all that. So let, can you help me understand, you know, what is mm -hmm. still there so we can deal with this? And surprisingly, um, I found that, you know, adopting this kind of attitude, like this willingness to basically look at the dukkha instead of focusing on, uh, it's, it's my father versus me. That actually is very liberating. I mean, actually, that got the job done. Uh, so I was actually quite surprised 
um, and quite uh, pleasant that we were able to have an honest conversation. And I'm beginning to understand that, you know, it's not so much like the, my father that is the enemy. It seemed to me that it's really the dukkha. Like, I, I'm not really angry at the father. I just don't like the dukkha. Uh, so <laughs> that, whole, that is really, really deep insight. Uh, like it, it's more like the dukkha, and so now I've made it a point to see like you know when when is dukkha dukkha coming up, and I see like it feels like looking at it like that, a lot of the things become less personal because it's not because even he is like a, a like a victim of the the thoughts that keep rehearsing and everything, so it's not really his fault at all. <laughs> like so, because I can understand like how even like for three days for me, I can observe like disturb like mental disturbance. It it puts you it like in some state of tension and just general unhappiness. Now imagine being like, exposed to that over tens of years. It's understandable that why somebody would act this way. It's completely understandable, actually. Yes, and that also you're, you, you are actually pointing at the reason why mm -hmm. medical science has come to understand that the aging process mm -hmm. is is part and parcel of being wrapped up with the cortisol mm -hmm. that builds up in the body, in the bloodstream, in the, in the cells. There is a mm -hmm. chemical that is given off by the adrenaline gland. Mm -hmm. It does two, two, two chemicals. One is adrenaline, the other one is cortisol. Mm -hmm. Adrenaline and cortisol work together, mm -hmm. but that adrenaline breaks down very quickly and cortisol over time builds up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in that regard also, the, the, um, the mental patterns or the habits mm -hmm. get deeper and deeper entrenched mm -hmm. as we grow older um, if we have no mindfulness. And mm -hmm. your dad doesn't have a mindfulness practice of waking up to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So he continues doing the same thing over and over again, which builds up those chemicals mm -hmm. and reinforces that position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it seemed like, you know, uh, uh, the, the real enemy, you know, wasn't so much my father versus me, but it was the dukkha that had appeared that was like growing as like the days went by. That was the real thing that needed to be Exactly. So mm -hmm. when he suffers, he thinks the suffering is coming from you. Mm -hmm. And when you're in discussion with him suffering, mm -hmm. you think that your suffering is coming from him. Mm -hmm. In that regard, both of you are wrong. Right. It's, it's but not it's really easier that. for you to see that your suffering is manufactured by you and your relationship to your dad, mm. and that if your dad could wake up, he could see that the suffering that he's getting from you is not actually from you. Mm -hmm. Is that um, his not liking? Yes. Yeah. What you're saying mm -hmm. that causes his suffering that he doesn't like it, so he's creating his own suffering, you're creating your own suffering, mm -hmm. but you're now beginning to see the suffering itself, mm -hmm. and you can recognize all. Oh, this suffering is a pool or a mess that both of us are stuck in. Yeah, exactly. Let us help each other to get out of this mess. <laughs> right. Yeah, because like most of the things, I'm pretty sure, like, you know, sometimes... It's not like, I mean, it's not like we want to have, like, like thoughts or, like, we want to, like, keep revisiting an argument, right? It's just because, like, if you don't have that mindfulness, that's what will happen. That's what's causing um, the, the, the thing to keep going on because the argument was long gone, but it's the mental rehearsal. Um, and the, every time you see it, it comes back that makes it so bad. And that was what needed to be stopped and pulled out, yeah. Right. This is so important of why the Buddha talks about be here in this present moment. Mm -hmm. You see what the mind normally does mm -hmm. is after we walk away from an argument and the physical argument is no longer happening, mm -hmm. the, the, the bad feelings about it are residual. Mm -hmm. And so the bad feelings and the thoughts mm -hmm. feed on each other mm -hmm. so that even 
the example that I use is the meditator has an argument with his um, uh, girlfriend. Then he comes to sit down to meditate, and while he's sitting down to meditate, he's not watching the breath, and he's not being here now. Instead, he's thinking about his girlfriend and that argument they had. And that's what you're doing, or that's what your dad is doing, except it is with you. Now, while the meditator is sitting there not meditating or thinking about the argument that he has, he goes back and forth from past to future in the sense of he said, she said, this is what was said. I should have said this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I had said that, then I wouldn't have felt so bad. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't know that. Right. Nobody knows. Exactly. Nobody knows. And so the, the rehearsal mm -hmm. then becomes suffering in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so we suffered in the past, we're suffering now, and when we do have a chance to get, have the conversation again, as soon as we approach the conversation, the feelings come back. Mm -hmm. And now we can't have a decent conversation because both are back into bad feelings based upon their memories of the bad feelings and the rehearsals of those bad feelings. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of wisdom to recognize that it's the suffering that both of you are trying to avoid <laughs> yeah. rather than he's causing my suffering and I'm causing his. No, each one is causing their own suffering, and you have a chance to see that. Mm -hmm. And when you see it, mm -hmm. you can change your plan. Yeah. And so I think you know what you talk about was right. Like at the end, right, when we had this discussion, what he really wanted you know, from his point of view was, you know, the the I guess like, like a bare minimum of respect. And that is basically some kind of recognition. That's really what he wanted at the end, some kind of recognition. Um, so I made it a point to, you know, give him some more positive comments and attention when possible. And I feel that, like, dealing with it like this, um, you know, is a lot better than, you know, whatever we were doing before, which is basically just flat out ignoring him and saying, ah, no, nah, I, I don't want anything to do with this, because that just makes it worse. I mean, you know, like, and... and that basically is like I, I don't like this, but you know I think now is like, it's a lot better. <laughs> so I, I mean hopefully I I don't forget this lesson. I don't want to forget this lesson. Um, it's a very strong lesson. Hopefully I don't forget. Um, excellent, yeah. excellent. So now you can change your entire relationship with your dad mm -hmm. because you're more mindful of his suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's not your job to bring him out of suffering in a general sense, but it is oh. your obligation to meet his suffering with joy. Oh, okay. Okay, there's a fine line there, right? Okay. Yes, you are not responsible for fixing his suffering, but you are responsible for meeting his suffering with joy. Okay. Do you hear the distinction? Mm -hmm. Because the, the natural vibrations of your joy mm -hmm. will mollify his mm -hmm. anger. In fact, what he wants is he wants respect from you. Giving him joy is the best way I know of of giving him respect. I see. Okay. Yeah. All so right. that, that was basically. Now, what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there's more, and that is the. Let me address the, uh, the technical issue about inkjet printers. Mm -hmm. First off. I have been around inkjet printers for so long that I was using them before they had the name inkjet printer. Oh, really? They're going way, way back. IBM developed the technology, and that um, how how the uh, printers work is with an electrostatic um, uh, little cell. Now, this happens very quickly, but what's happening is, is that when the cell has no charge on it, it expands, and through capillary action, the ink will go into that cell. Mm. And then when that cell is hit, it collapses, but the ink can't go back in the direction that it went, mm -hmm. uh, but it comes out the head. Oh, Okay, and so it's a little psioelectric um, a little cell that mm -hmm. when it's pulsed with electricity, it mm -hmm. pops like that. Oh. Okay, and so all of the electronics has to know exactly where the thing is lined up on the paper so that it'll know where to hit those cells. And if you look at it, they're only just a row of them. So in order to print one character, you mm -hmm. have to print while it's moving along. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so on the letter R, it's got to um, 
go this way. It, it all of them shoot for the top part of it, and then only uh, two of them shoot to start making the K. And oh, then gotcha. three ladders later, then then three dots are making as you're going along that letter. Okay, and so to make a letter uh, R, it has to print. Uh, it depends upon uh, the the matrix that you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, they're using very, very high precision now in the sense of in the old days, they used a, a 16 by 9. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, every letter could be fit into the, to the, to the 9 by 16 format. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest letters were the W and the M mm -hmm. for proportional spacing and the I and a, a period uh, are the smaller, and then they will use the space, and they'll put it, whether it's just mm. a small space or a large space, in order to print. Mm -hmm. Okay. This goes all the way back before mm -hmm. inkjet printers to selectric typewriters. Oh, wow. Okay, and that's what I was trained on to, to repair was the selectric typewriter. So I know inkjet printers down to that level. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the ink does not have to set in a little cartridge where the heads are, but that's the way that they're designed. Mm -hmm. A lot of more expensive and also retrofits is to buy um, a set of bottles of ink mm -hmm. that are in a plastic case, mm -hmm. plastic bottles, and then you'll have tubes. And if it's a four-color printer, then you'll have four tubes, one for the mm -hmm. yellow, one for the green, one for the blue, one for the black. Mm -hmm. If you have a, a high-precision printer that's going to be doing other colors, then you'll have a light blue and a dark blue yeah, it's like six and a dark yeah. red and an orange and things like that. And so you'll have more colors and you'll wind up. But all of them are in a, set, a flat set of tubes where all of them go from that tube bank Mm -hmm. down to the head, and so this tube bark has to move back and forth also. Mm -hmm. These have been used in Asia for years, but they have almost no market in the United States because the manufacturers know that they can make more money by putting the ink in the cartridge and then to sell the cartridge because the cartridge also has the print head. Yeah, the point. Yeah, exactly. Okay, oh. and they have it set so that if you take a cloth, a cloth and rub it across the print head, mm -hmm. what it does is it forces the ink that's that's uh, that's sitting there back into the dielectric and can ruin them very quickly. So you don't wipe it. Oh. But what you can do is you can make it start to print with very, there's programs that can bring them back to life and other things like that rather than just the printing that's available. They also have mm -hmm. pinpoints so that you can reset them. Oh. Okay, so now we're getting several different possibilities for a new printer for your dad is he can get a printer, uh, and then have this cartridge installed on it. Mm -hmm. And you can probably do that because they come as a kit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All you have to do, the only really difficult thing is, is that you have to either uh, find the plug to unplug it or to drill a little hole in that print head and mm -hmm. then put these wires in it. Oh. So that the uh, uh, these uh, plastic wires then go back to the bank of the ink mm -hmm. and you can put huge bottles of ink and you never have to change the print heads they, uh, because oh, they never oh. empty. Oh, wow. Okay. You put the ink in the ink bottle, and, and then what you have to do is to make sure that it's raised up mm -hmm. so that the, the ink will run down the small tubes mm -hmm. so that you don't – if there's any air pockets in there, then when the air pocket arrives at the print head, it'll stop printing. You think there's a problem. So mm -hmm. you have to keep track of the fact that there's ink going to be flowing in these uh, little tubes. They're almost always clear plastic. You can see exactly what color is there, et cetera. Oh, wow. Okay. It should be available on, on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm just got, not YouTube, eBay, because mm -hmm. a lot of eBay uh, sellers are um, international. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, I have to look into this, yeah. Okay, and I'll look at it, too, and see if I can find one for you. But uh, they're available here on this island, even. I mean, they're so popular that uh, uh, that most of the printers that use uh, places that have inkjet printers. Mm-hmm. Now, inkjet printers are problematic. Mm-hmm. But the, one of the problems that I had was is that I didn't use it enough. Oh, and then it gets clogged, right? And then it would get clogged because of lack of use because the ink will dry. Mm -hmm. And so a a rule of thumb would be to print at least one page a day. Oh, really? One page a day? At least one page a day because that will keep the ink moving. If you don't print a page a day, then yesterday's ink starts to dry right there in that uh, pyroelectric. Oh, wow. Okay. Gotcha. It's like, right. a, like a test page, like a day or something like that. Yeah, just run a test page a day and you'll do fine. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Cool. It uses a little more ink, but if you've got a good supply of ink, the ink is not the issue. The yeah. issue is that it stops printing even when there's ink in the cartridge. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I got to try that. Yeah, that's All right. sounds, like, sounds like important stuff. Yeah. Right, so if you have issues with inkjets, give me a call and we'll talk about it rather than just telling your dad no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I'm kind of happy this happened because, like, you know, it, it is like a lot of like it's good, it's good stuff, good stuff in the end, good stuff. <laughs> One of the things I remember a preacher in church saying when I was a teenager, and he was talking to the adults. To not, for husband and wife to not go to bed and go to sleep in the same bed with each other, angry at each other. They uh-huh. have to resolve their problem before they sleep on it. Uh-huh. Before they sleep. I have, I have come to understand that that's actually good advice. Really? Mm-hmm. It's really good advice. And the reason for that, if you go to sleep angry, you'll wake up angry, you, oh, you, you depart with each other all day, the anger is there the next day, and they are avoiding it and they don't finish it. You see, it you did the right thing. Yeah. yeah. Right, and so it's slowly, and this is why husband and wife will drift apart, is because they have bad feelings of, with each other and then they don't resolve them. All oh. they have is arguments. Oh, it's like... It's like there's like no communication happening, yeah. Right. And the real issue is is that they can't see the other person suffering. They can only see their own, mm-hmm. and they think the other person is causing their suffering. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But now that you're willing to see suffering, now that you're willing to see dukkha, mm-hmm. you can begin to recognize. Oh, wait a minute! Mm-hmm. The dukkha is the culprit, not my dad. Yeah, it's the dukkha. It it really is because like. Well, I mean, for me, like most of the time, it's not there. But then when you actually go and talk, it comes back. And so it shows that it's not really the thing. It, it's really that habit of that, that that's, whatever that comes back. That's the, the thing that's causing the issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So whenever you uh, are about um, to talk with your dad, you hear him coming or uh, you're about to approach him, the best way to do it is doing it mindfully. Make sure that you're taking deep yeah. breaths. Yeah, I think like. I think, like, it's, like, a super tough thing where it's, like, you know, like, in the practice, you can kind of laugh, you know, like, maybe three times out of ten, you kind of laugh, but to him, like, you can't laugh, because, like, you don't know which one's going to be, like, the, you know, like, the mind sweep, you don't know, like, when you click it, if it's going to fill up or not, so, yeah, it's really, it's, it's like, a, like, on steroids, like, mindfulness, but on steroids, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but other than that, I I was pretty happy like how how this turned out though. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, so 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 I I guess it's working. You know, like the the demo actually works. <laughs> it's like more proof that the demo works. <laughs> yes, that's that's the whole point. Is that once we have time after time after time of demonstrating to ourselves that the Buddha was right, that the that mm. the Dhamma works. Then we get kind of an overwhelming Mm -hmm. understanding that I've got to follow the Dhamma. That's the way to go. Looking at the suffering and the no suffering will solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thinking that that there's a problem Mm -hmm. will continue the problem. Thinking Mm -hmm. that there is suffering that needs to be 
investigated and removed sometimes very quickly. Mm -hmm. Just by taking a deep breath, the problem is solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I see. Then, in fact, there never was a problem between you and your dad. Mm -hmm. There never was. The only problem there was was ink jets clog. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and instead, the mind gets clogged up. Yeah. The mind gets clogged up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, for me, right? The first thing that started it was, like you said, ink jet gets clogged, but the rest was extrapolation. Like, okay, then ink jet gets clogged. I gotta spend like four or five hours doing the whole thing. Then I'm gonna hate it and all that. And then the whole thing blew up and then bam. Like this happened. No, wow. Yeah. And it happened so fast too. <laughs> yeah, it happened so fast. I was like, wow. Yeah. What brand of printer do you have? I think it was like, uh, it's like a can Canon, I think. It's a Canon printer. It was like is, a, it a, is it a Pisma or is it a higher quality? I don't remember the exact, it was like nine, 9020 or something like that. Uh, T9020, I, I think. Uh, let me take a look. T TS9020, I think that's what it was. Yes, okay, it's a Pisca, okay. Yeah, it's a Pisca, you're right. <laughs> yeah, so they're cheaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's, that's like the cheapest printer on the market. <laughs> You're really asking for trouble. I know I've had four of those printers myself because I always buy the cheapest printer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as long as it works. <laughs> yeah, so which is why, like, yeah, there's, like, definitely trouble, especially um, when the weather's cold, right? The ink, like, it prints with, like, like, artifacts and lines and then all that stuff like that. Terrible stuff. And it's, like, worse if you use, like, you know, replacement ink because that stuff's probably not... I, I'm not sure, like, how that stuff It's actually, it. no, it's not the ink itself. Oh, really? Yeah. Expensive ink and cheap ink mm -hmm. all come out of the same ink vat. Oh, wow. The cheap and the, and the uh, expensive comes with name branding and packaging. Seriously? Oh, my God. It's the same ink. It's all the same ink. It's all the same ink? Oh, wow. It's a matter of can you take care of the printheads. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow, okay. And that's how they make their money is by putting the ink package you get with the printhead. Oh, I actually thought, wow, that they but like... The expensive part is uh, and uh, if printhead goes bad, then you'll have to buy a new printhead. <laughs> but beware that that's what you're buying is a printhead with or without the ink. But oh. the ink is pennies. It's the printhead. Oh, wow. Well, okay, then I'm just going to tell them to buy cheap ink all day, all day long. <laughs> yeah. Because I used the to The clogging think... is not because of cheap ink. The clogging is because of lack of use of the printer. Exactly. If you print a test page every day, it won't. It won't, it won't like, blow up like that. Right. And that so uh, there's three ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. One is to buy the package that's sold by the manufacturer that has the printhead and the ink package together. Mm -hmm. The second option is, is to keep the same printhead but refill it yourself mm -hmm. with the ink that you can buy even in America. Mm -hmm. The third wow. way, which is the way that I'm saying, is buy um, a whole set of containers. Now, normally this, this set of containers is glued to the side of the printer. Mm -hmm. And then routed through a hole that they cut into the printer. The technicians here will do it. They'll set it up free if you buy it. Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. buy it with a brand new printer and or you can have it as a retrofit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the one that has the big bank of, of uh, ink that mm -hmm. then through a capillary tube mm -hmm. that may be three or four feet long. Mm -hmm. will run the ink down to the heads, and then the this, these capillaries are glued. They're, you cut a hole, you put the tube in, you glue it into place to prevent the uh, 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 any air linkage so that it's a, a thing. You raise the print uh, cartridges into the air to make sure that, you're, uh, that there's no capillary or mm -hmm. no um, um, mm -hmm. uh, air gaps mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. If there is an air gap and you print through it, that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
but you won't get any good printing right. while you're printing through that uh, that air tube. But once it reaches down, that uh, print head will start printing again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the three ways. Yeah, the fine. cheapest way is the second way. Just buy the ink and just keep putting it in there when you need to put it in there. That's the absolute cheapest way to do it. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what ink because it's all the same ink. Gotcha. Okay. I thought, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, well. All right, cheap ink. Oh my god, yeah. More mind blowing things. Okay, if there was in fact good ink and cheap ink, mm -hmm. and that the cheap ink ruined the print heads of printers, that cheap ink would go out of business. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. That's print, yet it's a huge industry. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Now that you know that, there, that the actual issue is coming out of the way that the, that the machine is designed for um, the, the actual purpose is, is to capitalize profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the ink inside the cartridge on the ink head, uh, on the, uh, the print head, mm -hmm. is not the best design, but mm -hmm. it's the most profitable design because the people have to buy the print head in order to get the ink. Oh man, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now that you know that you didn't even have to have that argument with your dad, mm -hmm. seems so pointless, right? But it happens for a reason. I learned so much, you know. From, from that's exact. That's the important thing now is to stay <laughs> with that. That you do not have to have printers. Mm -hmm. The problem with a printer become a problem between you and your dad. Yeah, that will never like, happen again. You can always be on his side. Remember, I told you to take his side, yeah. and now that this time you did, you really learned a big lesson about it. Yeah, <laughs> I really hope I remember this. Like, I like sometimes I, I really like want to remember this because it's like, but you know, sometimes I, I'm also like surprised a little bit sometimes how these insights, right? They come and go at, at times. Uh, actually, what what happens is you know sometimes I try to keep the things sometimes we discussed like previously for example like you know views are relative there's not really so much a right and wrong as there just is a i like it or i don't like it kind of thing sometimes mm -hmm. i completely forget um and sometimes it comes back and so i really hope like this one actually sticks with me because the what i've seen is the the duka can be so like so profound that it's 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 terrible like why would any <laughs> like, i wouldn't want anybody to go through stuff like this it's terrible it's absolutely terrible. Um, it just puts you into like a state of tension, and like you know, like it, like nobody should have to go through something like this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Hang on for just a second. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm looking for a particular um, image. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the many of the Dante's Infernos, and the one that I'm looking for is a pile of people in a in a pyramid where they're all stepping on each other. Mm -hmm. Trying to uh, uh, reach the top of the pile, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing that particular image. Let's see what this one is. Mm -hmm. Oh well, I'll have to look it up later. Right. It may not be under the name of Dante's Inferno, but it, I see several of them as triangles. But it, they all seem to be upside down for some reason. So it's not mm -hmm. the one that I'm. That I'm thinking mm -hmm. of. Uh... Okay. This one. <laughs> this is a much more modern version of it, but this will do. Let me see if I can send this to you. Mm -hmm. uh, 
copy image. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to use this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Before I could do a, let me do a chat. Mm -hmm. No, it's got you. <clears throat> I used to be able to do, mm -hmm. uh, uh, get an SMS and send a text message to you with uh -huh. Skype. Or you could you, share can, can you do that? Can you send me one? Because I know if, if sure. you send me one, it'll open it up, and then I can send, just say hi. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I just did. Yeah. Mm. So I think, like, the chat button is on, like, the bottom left corner of your screen. It's, like, like on, like, that little blurb with, like, three lines or something like that. Here. Got it. Yeah. There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, yeah, it's loading. Oh, wow. What is... Oh, my God. <laughs> That's New York. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, that's actually a pretty good segue um, into, I guess, like, work. Because, like, yeah, it's it's so true. It's, it's like, um, so, you know, this is, like, one of the first times in my relatively short career where, you know, I have to, you know, we have some managers that just keep asking us, like, why are there so many problems? Like, when can you finish this? When that? It's like, sometimes you don't even know how to answer the question. And I just hope nobody says anything on the phone. And I was like, oh, man, this is just, oof, this is just awkward. <laughs> and uh -huh. I think, like, everybody's under, like, pressure to deliver and all that stuff like that. Honestly, that kind of sucks. Like, you know, like it, it, it sucks, honestly. Uh, <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Okay, and so what we begin to see is is that that pile of people is not really the place to be. Yeah, honestly. at least not men mentally is to get out of it. Yeah, and so this is why the Buddha likes seclusion. Is once you recognize that you can get out of that pile of people mm -hmm. and be off on your own then coming back to that pile of people doesn't look nearly as delicious as it did when you were in that pile of people. Oh, yeah, to totally. No, no, it sucks. It, 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 because it's, like, it's convenient, but, like, it's not worth, like, the pressure and everything. Like, it's not, it, it's, it just isn't, like, worth the sand. Like, it's just not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing is everyone in that pile mm -hmm. only sees their own ambition. Mm. They do not see the suffering either in their own minds or in the minds of all of the other people in that uh, mountain trying to climb to the top. Mm -hmm. Only realizing that it's a mountain of people, there's no ground to climb on. The only thing that there is to step on is somebody else's face. Yeah, I see. Oh, I see what you mean. I mean, it, it, it kind of, yeah, because it's like the thing that's causing it, right? It's not really the person, but it's like, some kind of thought pattern that says like, oh, I need to become like a director. I need like a bigger house. It's that kind of mass, like, I guess like mass dukkha. That's really the issue here. I, like, again, it's not really like a manager being the problem, but it's like his own pressure to deliver his own, like, exactly. whatever it is. It's Absolutely. That. Exactly. So really, this is what you can do then when one of these, uh, mm -hmm. and I, uh, you actually work in a Wall Street brokerage, don't you? Luckily, I'm technology, not business. Because I, if, if oh, I were business, I wouldn't. That's even think. worse. <laughs> it's even worse, right? Yeah. That's why I can still do nine to five. Because if I were business, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. <laughs> you'd be, you'd be in a great state of suffering. Exactly. Okay. And yet the business side is um, pressuring the. Um, the technology side. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in fact, you know where the pressure is coming from for your boss. Mm -hmm. So when your boss comes, this is what you can do. This is a, you'll, you'll find uh, variations on this, but it basically goes like this. He comes up and he says, rah, 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 when is this going to be finished, all of that? The answer is, oh, it sounds like they've been, they've been putting you under a lot of pressure about this. Mm -hmm. oh. It sounds like they're putting you in. In other words, you actually address the suffering of your boss. 
Mm-hmm. Got it. It looks like you're, they're putting you under a lot of pressure for this. Let mm-hmm. me see if I can help you. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. In other words, now you're taking your boss's side. Mm-hmm. Before you were in the pecking order. Do you know what I mean by a pecking order? It's like, like uh, because like no, not 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 exactly. Yeah. Like, All right. Let me give you the traditional che- checking pecking order. Mm-hmm. The boss screams at the uh, uh, the senior boss screams at the junior boss. The junior boss screams oh. at his employee. The employee screams at the janitor. The janitor goes goes home and screams at his wife. The wife screams at the kid, oh. and the kid kicks the dog. Gotcha. I see. Okay. okay. You need to you need to break that up. At that level where your junior manager is coming to um, to mess with you mm-hmm. because he's been messed with in that pecking order, mm-hmm. elevate yourself up to his level of suffering mm-hmm. by see. addressing it directly. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you're having a really hard bo- uh, hard time today. Mm-hmm. All right. What that's likely to do is to change his focus on. Uh, you're my cause of suffering because you're not delivering what my bosses want. That's the normal position of the of the uh, pecking order. Mm-hmm. But you're going to interrupt that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to interrupt that by by um, meeting his suffering directly. Oh, it sounds like they mm-hmm. are putting pressure on you. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can help you. I see. Mm-hmm. So, so now you're becoming the friend, mm-hmm. and that you and your boss are now identifying the source of the suffering is not between the two of you. Mm-hmm. It's because something that's come from the outside for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like, well, then what if he says like, no, you don't understand. No, you don't got it. Like, when are you going to deliver? Because I heard him say like, you know, say like, and so some people, some people say, okay, you know, I, I, I get it. You know, I'll, you know. Do this, and he's like, "No, you don't get it." You know, like blah 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 blah. What are you gonna do? Tell me, like that. I was like, "Ooh, tough calls, man. Really tough calls." Like, <laughs> then what you can say is, "What is your idea? What do you think is the solution to the problem?" I see. Because what I see is like, so like a lot of the people there, right? There, you'll have to. Here's the thing: you've got to get out of your own way. Uh huh. You cannot be Willie's being suppressed right now mentality. Uh, You've got to see his dukkha, not receive it. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. It's so true, though, because it's like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Because, like, there is a fear. It's not, it's like part fear and part also I'm beneath him, right? Because, like, because especially work, right? It seems like conventionally we would think that we're dependent on it. So that on that, because of the money. And that automatically already like strips you, I guess, like of the normal way of thinking, where you are literally your mind is get. Oh, okay, I see what you mean now. Yeah, uh-huh. I see what you mean when you say like it actually enslaves us to this because the mind will think that yes, we're dependent on this for everything because that's where we get our money from. That's where everything comes from. Automatically, we're enslaved. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Now that's really. Stuff. And in that regard, almost trivial things become life and death issues. That's so true. Like even like uh, you know remarks of getting slightly criticized, you it will set you into a fight, like fight or flight. You know because you're worried about the future. You're worried about oh God, what will this do to my performance? Oh God, what is that? This. It's so true. Because uh, I've seen my own like physiological reactions. And I imagine that it must be so much worse for my older uh, coworkers who have kids that are going through school or are really young or going through college. What a terrible way to live. <laughs> what a terrible way to live. That's so bad. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So you can actually see mm-hmm. how that hierarchy works is the guy on the top steps on somebody below him, he has to pass that down by stepping on somebody below that, and now you've got the pecking order. Mm-hmm. I, I like to, the, this by the way, the pecking order that I just gave you is actually out of transaction analysis, and, the, and the, the last one, the kid kicks the dog, that's what Burns said. That's actually Eric Burns' idea, <laughs> is when he gets down to the point that as a kid, mm-hmm. he, he, can't, he can't go back up the ladder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, 
Yeah, you know, could you want pause one second? I just want to ask my father like, because he has work tomorrow. I'll probably just move out and let him sleep because uh, I'm I'm in this room. So I'm just gonna ask him if he wants to sleep. One second, one second. Okay. Yeah, yeah one second. Yeah, sorry. I'll be right back too. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep, yeah. I just told him to knock, and he was like, "Yeah, no, that's fine. You can do it. like." Um, so I just told him to knock if he wants to like sleep. So I just walk out when he like sleeps or something. But yeah, um, it's interesting because sometimes I I wonder like, can I actually totally be completely free of this like this whole like uh, New York City kind of thing? Um, it like the more I see this, right, the more I'm convinced that this is like this is absolutely terrible. Um, like the, it's like a state of fear, right? You got the money. It's not, sometimes it's not even worth it. Um, like you said, like, just get like bare minimum, like minimum, like food, clothing, shelter, or medicine. Mm-hmm. The rest is, yeah, it really sucks, honestly. <laughs> I'll be very honest here. I mean, and I consider myself lucky. Nine to five, like, eat, like that technology, that's, like, that's unheard of. Uh, I don't want to be like, you know, the, doing, like, production issues, like, in the weekend or something like that. This is a terrible way to live. Uh, like, it's so true. Um, so, yeah, not, like, I, it really does bring in the question, like, every time I, I, I go to work or I sit, you know, in the office, I'm just like, this is, this is terrible, honestly. It, it, it it's, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I, I question, you know, like, kids, like, are they really worth it? Um, um, I mean, right now, of course, my answer is no. Like, they're not worth it. Um, of course, playing with somebody else's kid uh, is a different story. <laughs> it's like playing with somebody else's puppy. It's always nice because you don't have to, like, you know, pick up the poop and all that stuff. But I really see, like, you know, the more serious thing is, like, I really see, like, people are working themselves to death trying to raise their kids. Um, they're scared uh, for their jobs, right? They keep, they need more money, and especially now uh, in New York City, right? You want to you want them to get to like Ivy League, right? Like back when I got into Cornell, it was e- like easier. But even now, like seven or eight, well, it's like what, like seven or seven years since I I got, I got in. There's so much more competition now. Nowadays, your kid has to be like has like two or three extracurriculars. They need a really high GPA, and they have to score near perfect, like you know, fifteen hundred plus on the SAT in order to get in. Then you gotta tutor them, right? That puts pressure on the kid too, because they've already got school, and then they got to come home and do extra on the weekends and everything. Everybody suffers. It's so bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's all done in the name of greed. Greed. It's all done. In fact, even in the university, going back to that uh, uh, photo that I sent you, mm-hmm. the students are in that pile also. In fact, the students have their own pile. Oh. A competition, academic competition. Uh, Africa, academic competition, exactly. Wow. Oh yeah, I've seen some. I've seen some like unethical things happen too. It's like uh, people, some like someone in the stats class. They comp, they uh, uh, collect homework on the desk. So before you leave, you pile everything onto the desk. And I had heard what somebody did was they took somebody's like homework off the desk. They copied the homework. Then they put their their copy on the desk and threw away the original copy. So not only was it like, let me copy you, it was also like, you wouldn't get the points either. I was like, oh gosh, that's evil. That's so unethical. Yeah. <laughs> it's very bad. But people feel that they have to do that to get the advantage because they do not trust themselves 
to be able to do it. Yeah. Or that they don't want to take the effort that it takes to do it. So we're looking for shortcuts. But the whole point is greed. Greed. Mm -hmm. Greed. And uh, the greed that's in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Greed that's in a hurry? Uh -huh. Yeah, greed that's in a hurry is, is worse than greed that can take its time. In fact, the greed that can take its time is going to be more successful than greed that's in a hurry. You mean like greed that somebody plans out like that, like that kind of thing? Oh, calculation, like calculated greed? Yes, let us say it this way. In the United States, mm -hmm. everything has to do with the bottom line and that uh, the way the thing is structured um, from um, what they call Witching Fridays. Witching Fridays, okay. Do you know what I mean by, by Witching Friday? Okay, part of it has to do with a time limit that is placed on short cells. Okay. All right, but also that uh, the stock market has to go up mm. uh, or that your stock in your company has to go up or the stock, uh, or the, um, people will sell it. Oh, you mean like shorting like a stock or something like like, like people like when people not short. only shorting not only shorting stock but even long but there is short term capital gains and long term capital gains etc oh, like that you. yeah oh. so there's a lot of laws and regulations and things like that that put a short time frame on not only Wall Street mm -hmm. but then every business that's uh, that's on Wall Street mm -hmm. is under a time pressure to get her done get the profits up right away. Right, the quarterly earnings and things like the that. The quarterly yeah. reports, exactly yeah. what we're getting at. Mm -hmm. All right, and that also happens with infrastructure. Infrastructure mm. takes a long, long time, mm. Mm. and that's why there's now no infrastructure in the United States, or almost no infrastructure is because it's not profitable for the short term. Oh, people want, they want money and they want it now, like that. Right, like, instant like, gratification, all right? Now, uh, one of the things that we know of about the practice of the Dhamma is, is that it's skill development, that mm -hmm. things take time, partly because uh, we spent many, many years building habits, and so mm -hmm. those habits go deep, deep, deep by the years, and so it's going to take a lot of mindfulness and a lot of right effort to come out of those old bad habits. Mm -hmm. But once we get into the habit of coming out of the old bad habits, we begin to see things at a much longer time frame. Mm. And the way that you can think of it is, is the Buddha thought in, time, in his time frame was generations. Generations. Oh, my God. His clock, his clock ticked <laughs> generationally. Oh, wow. The, and that he says that that's why he teaches the Dhamma is for future generations. Mm -hmm. Another example of that is, is that you've got a desert. Mm -hmm. The thing to do immediately in that desert is to get out of the desert. Mm -hmm. The long-term solution is, is to replant the desert and reclaim the desert, reforest the desert. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of techniques. Mm -hmm. And, and, in fact, if you look at it, then you'll see that the Chinese, because they're, they've got problems with sand and pollution and other things like that, uh, that mm -hmm. cause them immediately, but their, their solutions are not immediate solutions, they're long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The way, to, the way to, uh, uh, to take care of the Yellow Dragon, the Gobi Desert, is by planting, mm -hmm. planting. And to now, this year, by the way, China has actually reversed the desertification of all the land that, that they're under, uh, that's under the control of the Chinese government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not true worldwide yet. Still, mm -hmm. the Sahara is advancing. Mm -hmm. But they're building a, gr a green line that's 15 kilometers. Already, the country of Senegal has already finished their line. And so they're going to stop the desertification. Mm -hmm. These are really, really long-term projects that are going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And so this is the way to start to, to think, that mm -hmm. even the Dhamma 
2,500 years has had enormous success. If we can say that the success of it is 25 or 30,000 people on the planet Earth being enlightened all at the same time, and yet 25,000 or 100,000 as compared to 7 billion is still quite small. Mm -hmm. Right. But if, but if you recognize, oh, well, 2,500 years ago when the Buddha was around, before that there was nobody. Right. I mean, at least, so yeah. It's going to take a while. It's this long, slow process. It's not proselytizing for religion because a religion capitalizes on the suffering mm -hmm. by telling the victim, oh, if you do what our religion says to do, then the things about the religion will take you out of your suffering as a victim. Mm -hmm. Okay, like take Jesus as your Savior right. exactly. or the five five pillars of Islam or whatever it is, you have to do what you're told to do. Mm -hmm. And then somehow magically the suffering will will be over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. No, we realize and that that's in fact why Buddhism doesn't proselytize. We're not looking for adherents or converts mm -hmm. because when people convert, they haven't really learned anything. Right. They just blindly accept it. Right. Right. So the real issue is: Can we teach the students how to see suffering? Mm -hmm. If they can see suffering and see what it's like and see the nature of suffering, in other words, they begin to understand the Four Noble Truths in deep reality, mm -hmm. then that individual on his own, through his own wisdom of seeing suffering, can find his way out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially when we already have the key point is, is that the cause of suffering is my own mind. Mm -hmm. right. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I actually have like a point. This raises a, a point is, for example, right? So you know we say that like the Buddha said, you know, um, you need like some basics, right? Like basic food, clothing, shelter, and medicine, in order for there to not be suffering. Like but below that baseline, you have suffering, right? Um. So does that like, it, like you know, for example, like say that you don't have enough medicine, right? There's like maybe like physical sensations that cause suffering. Can that kind of suffering be eliminated as well? So I guess like, you know, the direct, I guess like uh, analogy to me is when I did not have the fancy biologic injections, right? My eczema progressed and I can't, I couldn't even sleep for like an hour straight. So, you know, that's like, and, and of course like physical pain everywhere, like around this neck. Couldn't turn this neck. If, you, if, if I did this, like so much pain here, like I was bleeding out all the time. Like that kind of uh, suffering, uh, can that be eliminated? As well, is that even possible? Uh, caused by like, yeah. Gosh, you're asking an important question. Let me see if I can address it from several different perspectives. Mm -hmm. One of them is is that we modern medical science has come to understand that diet mm -hmm. has a lot to do with skin, mm -hmm. and that and the reason for the diet is is because diet controls the gut. Mm -hmm. And that what's happening in the gut mm -hmm. is the source for either our good health or our um, uh, sickness. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the first thing. Is is that um, the solution to the eczema mm -hmm. may not be the medicine that the doctors give you because Definitely. they're trying to uh, uh, solve the, the the symptoms. Yeah that there's two other things that need to be looked at other than that. One is the mind, and the other one is the diet that's affecting the gut. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you now, and you'll probably believe me, that New York City is not known to have the best food. Terrible. Terrible food, overpriced, and heavily like flavored. Very bad things in the long term. Yes. Yes. Bad things. And so um, an example of that also is, is that not only... Um, do we not get enough fruits, but that, that we're not careful of them. An example of that is, is that for centuries, rice, for instance, have taken the husk off, and yet we, we hear now that whole, whole grain and whole foods are supposed to be good for us. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they may not be. Old ancient wisdom. Mm -hmm. An example of that was is that the tomatoes... Mm -hmm. originally came from China, 
and that when they were introduced to uh, the uh, to Italy through um, probably uh, uh, Marco Polo, that he introduced them in such a way that the that the uh, uh, the Chinese method of cooking and using the tomatoes was brought to Italy, uh-huh. and that the way that they do that is is that the tomato they they will peel it. And they don't eat the seeds. They will de-seed and de-peel. Mm-hmm. And then all the rest of the tomato is good. But the peelings and the, uh, and the seeds mm-hmm. have things in them mm-hmm. that um, you can look into this. I'm, I'm no expert at all. Mm-hmm. But I'm just giving you an example of mm-hmm. how diet affects us in ways that we don't even know. Mm-hmm. And so start watching what you're eating and how it affects yeah, your your definitely. skin, okay. But we also know that it, that is mental, mm-hmm. even more so. Mm-hmm. So the the diet and uh, the uh, your mental state. Mm-hmm. And so let me ask you this: How is your eczema now? Is it reduced or is oh, it so, uh, still there? Yeah. So the biologic like suppresses the is has suppressed like a majority uh, of the eczema. So I can sleep again. <laughs> so it's a lot better. Uh, thanks to modern medicine, but of course it it, it comes with a price um, because it suppresses a a portion of my immune system. This makes things like cold sores uh, e- like uh, more common, I guess. And so to do that, I have to take Valtrex to suppress the cold sores. Mm-hmm. Long term consumption of Valtrex will weaken your kidneys because the the Valtrex is extremely harsh, actually. So I try yes. not to take it often, but if it doesn't, if I don't take it too much, then it will start to come back. And if it comes back, then I get like a massive outbreak. Um, so it, it's still, it, it's not a solution, um, but yeah. You know. So it doesn't come back slowly. It comes back with a vengeance, huh? Is that what happens? Oh, so I can feel it if it so if it starts coming back. I because like I always I've become more mindful of this. Like if I like if I can feel like the nerve like tingling like sensation or the burning sensation, then I know that it's about to come back. And then I take the valve tracks. Um, and, uh, it's not, it, 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 but like all this is like, it's just like this whole thing sucks. <laughs> Again, like it's, it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. One of the things that I'm thinking about now is, is that if it starts to come back mm-hmm. and it is, it's a uh, gut oriented, mm-hmm. you might want to experiment by drinking a lot of water. Mm-hmm. And the time to drink a lot of water, I'm talking about maybe four liters, one liter after another after another. Oh, really? Then you'll, yeah, a lot of water. Ah. Why? Because you want to purge everything that's in your gut out. You want to let it go. You'll do a lot of peeing and probably have loose bowels if you drink four liters of water all at once. Okay, let me let me try that. Like, I'll start at like one liter and then ramp it up and see what okay. happens. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, one liter for a little guy like you, you probably feel really full, but that that fullness will only last 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Gotcha. And then you can start drinking again. Yeah, yeah, because like when I was young, I hated vegetable and I ate so much like sweet stuff. So I'm pretty sure you're right. Like it, it, it is like gut based. I've experimented with probiotics as well, um, and that improved my eczema, but then it levels off. Um, after a certain amount, I looked up certain strains of uh, probiotics, um, so Alplantarum, that reduce histamines level, histamine levels uh, in the bloodstream. And I find that to help, but that did not curb the severity of my eczema. It helped and then it leveled off. But I, re- I am kind of convinced that it has to do with years of bad habits. And then finally, when your intestines can't take it, it spills out uh, into your skin. <laughs> so... Mm-hmm. You know, cause and effect. <laughs> All right. Well, now that you've been climbing on the human uh, mountain ladder of Cornell and of uh, a technical brokerage in New York, I'm not recommending, or nor would I tell any student that, oh, you've got to go quit your job. You've got to get out of that environment. Mm-hmm. But I can say mm-hmm. exactly the same thing by taking the part of take, quit your job, and mm-hmm. let's focus on how to get out of the environment because the environment is both physical and mental. Yeah, like that's the thing. I, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly, right? Because it's like, do I really, like sometimes I really think like, 
you know, they, part of me, I, I mean, I know, like, part of me is like, you know, yes, I like to go out on a farm and just like, like, do, like just, just go over there and just do it. But of course, it's going to be hard work at a farm as well, right? The grass is always greener. It's just like the mind saying, like, I, I don't want this. So, you know, it, it, that's, that, that must be better. I must have that. that, that that's just another, like, excuse. So I, I don't know what to do sometimes because I don't know how to reconcile sometimes the, the Dharma with, like, being here, like, in the New York City. <laughs> sometimes, like, there are parts of it where I just can't, like, because you do it, like, you know, studying the Dharma and then saying that we live in New York City is is asking for it because you know that these two things are incompatible and yet we're saying okay how can I do this while doing this it's it's not possible right? <laughs> like yes it well ultimately is not possible right ultimately like completely but but right. but let us put it this way before we go too far mm-hmm. ultimately mm-hmm. ultimately the only solution. Mm-hmm. To dukkha, so that you are absolutely one hundred plus percent free mm-hmm. and one hundred percent free from suffering mm-hmm. and one hundred percent at peace. Uh-huh. The only way dead? to do that is to be dead. Yeah, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, death is the highest peace. That That's so true. long as you're alive. Your job will be to avoid suffering because it'll be after you. Right, because I have to it'll stay alive. Available. That's uh-huh. You got to stay alive. So in that level, even breathing is an effort. Yes. Right. Right. And for a lot of people who have really deep problems, breathing is an effort. Mm-hmm. And at the end of life, breathing finally becomes such an effort that we stop breathing. That's part of dying. Mm-hmm. Is when breathing becomes such an effort that we don't do it anymore. An example of that is when people have pneumonia, mm-hmm. because if they if they if the pneumonia gets too much, then the mm-hmm. lungs are full of fluid, which means in order to get the proper amount of oxygen that one needs, takes a lot of effort to keep breathing and breathing mm-hmm. hard. Now, if that person is put in the hospital, mm-hmm. the doctors will put them on morphine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's sure to kill them. Morphine yeah. will kill somebody with um, um, uh, uh, congestion in the lungs, pneumonia, more than anything else, and yet that's common. I know of people who have been, who have died that way. Oh wow! All right, what you need when you've got pneumonia is oxygen. Mm-hmm. That's what you need. The question okay. is, can you get that oxygen by working? <sighs> <sighs> and I've seen that myself. I have actually been, this happened either uh, 2016 or 17, but I remember the month was November and how I caught it. And by the end of November, I was in the hospital. I was in the hospital three days on oxygen. I was ready to go home. And when I went back home, I got really sick again. Mm-hmm. When I'm saying sick is, is that, uh, I was going back to the same thing, which you you would know that if someone's a, a good meditator, the easy thing to do is to go into state deep states of meditation, but with the lungs full of uh, fluid, the, there's not enough oxygen, mm-hmm. and so we go down. Mm-hmm. But in fact, with with that, we don't want to be in a deep state of meditation. We want to be at a state so we can breathe. Uh-huh. And I started to force myself to breathe, and by doing that, within 24 hours, I was able to cure myself of the um, uh, mm-hmm. of the pneumonia mm-hmm. by just keeping forcing that air out, in and out and in and out. Because what happens is, is that dry air comes in, it's going to take some of that moisture out with it. Mm-hmm. But if you're only breathing slightly, or you're not breathing really heavily, deeply. Mm-hmm. Then the then that moisture will collect in the lungs, mm-hmm. and so in fact, okay, yeah, sure, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's good all the time. That's why we need to start taking these deep breaths, is because mm-hmm. the body on its own breathes at kind of a minimal level, mm-hmm. right? The minimal amount. So taking these extra deep breaths is what gives oxygen to the brain. Mm-hmm. Etc. like that. So whenever you've got to deal with your dad, the uh-huh. thing to do is to start taking some deep breaths mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. oxygenated so that then mm-hmm. you can be sharp enough to watch 
to suffering mm -hmm. and to see, see suffering as suffering rather than um, an argument or, mm -hmm. or right. whatever. Right, exactly. Yeah, so wait, let me, let me move out one second. One second. Oh, you, you see, I'm going to talk to you again, because I'm going to talk to you again. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you again. That's fine, okay, I'm going to talk to you again. Okay, have a good night. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, one second, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, one second, okay. Is yeah, that okay. Mandarin or Chinese? Oh, that, I that's, mean, that's, is that Mandarin or, or Cantonese? Oh, that's Cantonese, yeah, that's Cantonese. Oh, okay. <laughs> I I I know enough Thai that I could pick my way through Mandarin, and what you were doing, I was lost. I was completely lost. <laughs> yeah. I thought it might be Cant Cantonese. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, it was Cantonese. It was Cantonese. My Mandarin is okay, but like not not nearly fluent enough to do something like to say something like that. Right? Yeah, but it, it it's true though. It's like you know what what else can be done? Uh, I guess like uh, uh, while I'm actually still in the city. Um, that's my question, um, because like like you said, like ultimately these two things are incompatible, like like uh, like ultimately completely free. So you know, like the the recognition here is that yeah, it probably won't be completely free, like free until I sit down or lay lay down in the coffin, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. You won't be completely free until after it's all over anyway. So what we have to do mm -hmm. is guide ourselves towards mm -hmm. less and less suffering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And keep going in that way. So the, the more often you have your mind clean and fit for work, then the more often you're going to see suffering as suffering mm -hmm. gotcha. and not get caught in it. All mm -hmm. right. So that's what that's the way of, of looking at it. Another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was already preparing for that. This state that we're talking about is what the Buddha and the ancients were talking about as first jhana. Mm -hmm. What is not first jhana, what is normal mind state is, is that we're unaware of our feelings and we're on automatic pilot and we're also generally not aware of our thoughts and we're certainly not in control of our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first jhana is when we have uh, taken control of our thoughts and are capable of thinking what we want to think. Mm -hmm. We can apply the mind and keep the mind focused on what we want to keep it focused on. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this is this is something that can be done while walking and talking. You mm -hmm. can drive a car. You can do all kinds of things like that. But you can stay focused in the here now. Mm -hmm. That's that's the state to be in. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha talks about it, that that's the path to enlightenment, not the deeper states mm -hmm. to just be here now. Mm -hmm. Just be aware of what's going on around you. When you see people, you see them in suffering mm -hmm. rather than as trying to take advantage of you, etc. In mm -hmm. the regard, so going back to the boss, mm -hmm. instead of being in the pecking order that he knows and expects you to be in, you can jump out of the pecking order by mm -hmm. addressing his feelings mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. By saying, oh, wow, they must have put you under a lot of pressure today. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can take care of that issue. That's mm -hmm. a way of saying it. Uh, Let me see if I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So you join his side. You become part of his team mentally. Mm -hmm. Mentally. Got it, got it, yeah. Mentally join his team. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, yeah. Okay, yeah, that. Okay, that definitely says, so, mm -hmm. so look at it like this. Mm -hmm. Here's your boss mm -hmm. with a gun, and here's you, all right? What you need to do is, is come over here and say, here, let me shoot, help you shoot that. <laughs> and by doing so, you're not the target anymore. Mm -hmm. Now the target is not you. Now the target is what he needs done. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I see. So I can like do this mentally, right? Like in my head, right? Not so much that I must, like, right? It's not. It's not to be subservient, but to realize that. Uh, okay, there's not so much to fear here. Actually, I'm not as dependent on the money as I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. 
because, you know, like, one thing that really does hit home is, like, you know, when we talked about how, you know, like, especially in a place like New York, your existence, you know, it, it, it is, feels like you owe your existence to so many other different things that it doesn't really, be, like, you know, it kind of sucks, right? It really sucks because your existence is owed to so many different things, right? For some people, it's the mortgage bills. For some other people, uh, it's raising their kids. For uh, still other people, it's whatever they need, like maybe even their basic needs um, as well. Um, feels like, you know, in the city, it, this problem is especially amplified. Um, it's terrible. Yeah. Well, we are interdependent. Mm -hmm. But in, in cities like New York, mm -hmm. uh, th that, uh, that interdependency uh, becomes a need. Yes, exactly. That sometimes ambition is not ambition, it's just need. I'm, in, I'm struggling here. In other words, I can't even follow my ambition because I can't even keep up with where I was a minute ago. I'm falling backwards. Right. Okay, we're in a state of need now. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, so yeah, you don't need to do that. You do not need to be put into the position. You do not want to be put into the position of being the object of uh, uh, or the target of your boss. Mm -hmm. You want to join him and make the target not another person, but the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like computer science, especially this field, right, uh, highlights the hard to maintain aspect of things that we had discussed. Because, you know, in this field, everything moves so fast. You know, even now when I come back from work, I have to practice interview questions because you, you never know when... Um, layoffs are going to happen. In fact, my boss and another co-worker, they got laid off immediately. Just like uh, two, two, I think like three, four weeks ago, I was telling you like a couple lessons back, boom, they just got, you know, laid off. Next day, they just worked from home, worked from home, and then we got the announcement. And so, you know, this, sorry, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Petty, uh, P-E-T-T-Y. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, but but the but the issue is, um, yeah, it's like it's hard to maintain because you do. I mean, now I've been maintaining it for like a year or two, but you have to come back and you have to revisit the theoretical foundations. Once you have that, then you have to keep up on the newest frameworks, the newest like architectures, the newest design. You don't do that, then you know you're 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 getting tossed. Um, and apparently I was talking to a coworker. We have it easy over here in the East Coast because it's not the real tech center. Everybody over there in Silicon Valley, they're under 35. And once you reach 35, if you're not management, you're getting fired because why would they uh, keep someone who's 35 and older when they can hire somebody who is 10 years younger and probably works twice as hard through the nights? That's actually what my coworker's son told like us because he works on, in Silicon Valley. He was at the startups there. And even there, it's even worse than here. <laughs> it's, crazy. it's crazy. You know, when when technology and uh, when technology was more primitive and um, learning was, let us say, more difficult, mm -hmm. uh, the traditional ways of looking at things is is that the elders still have things to teach the younger. Mm -hmm. Now that we have high tech and, and uh, technology, what has happened is is that youth has had the advantage because learning is easier for the young than it is for right. the old. Right. All right. However, there are things that can be learned that take time to learn. Making like, mistakes. Like In the fact, <laughs> Yeah. Right, exactly, that some things are hard to learn and hard to apply. And so in that regard, um, the, the, the young men who fire the older men uh, because they're looking for uh, the new, what might happen is, yes, they might work twice as hard, but they'll have to work five times longer because they made the same mistakes that the old guy made, and he knows that now. 
Right. But on the other side of that, it's not a lot of it is not over and over and over and over again. We can see clearly how mm -hmm. um, Einstein was built on Newtonian physics, but but Newton was building on Copernicus, but Copernicus was building on etc. like that. And so now that we have um, um, Einstein, that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true in computers. Everybody who started off with computers and computer science in uh, the 1960s had to learn machine code, mm -hmm. at least a little bit. Right. Before you learned an assembler, you had to do it at machine code level before you ever got an assembler. And then when we got assemblers, later we got languages, and then there was an explosion of languages. Now what we find is is that the languages are building upon each other. The students right. are never given uh, a machine language to learn. Right. I don't think you've ever sat in front of a computer and done flip switches and got the word right and then said push, and then you get the next set of flip switches. The first one line is what the address is that you're going to enter this data, and the next line of switches, bit by bit, is what's going to be put into that location, and then you push the button, and that location gets this data. And then you change the location, and then you change the data. And so, I oh, mean, <laughs> well, that's where computers started. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so what I'm saying is okay. much of the knowledge that I learned as a computer scientist is completely useless now. Uh, it's changed, yeah, definitely. And in, then, in fact, uh, uh, I was probably the last COBOL expert in the world. Uh -huh. Why? Because I was maintaining COBOL for the uh, Hewlett Packard uh, uh, HPUX. Really? And it was a really, really excellent COBOL. It was so good. But uh, um, the woman, I forget her name now, closed down uh, HPUX. Oh. And they went to uh, uh, Linux. Mm -hmm. Now, Hewlett Packard's uh, U, uh, Unix was the very, very best. Uh -huh. But not only did they lose the very best operating system on the planet, they mm -hmm. also lost ten, uh, no, about 6,000 of the very best computer scientists as an organization. Because they closed, right? They closed down. Because they closed it down. Mm -hmm. They could have redirected that. They could have done anything. So it wasn't the individual computer scientists because we all got jobs easy after that. Uh. <laughs> but it was a loss for Hewlett Packard because they lost a collection of a, a group of computer scientists that they had been spending 30 years to develop. Uh, I see. That was a major tragedy. But here's the point that I'm making is, is that... Um, over the generations of computer science, just like over the generations of mathematics, mm -hmm. that in the early days, we were still trying to figure out what was 90 degrees and why was 90 degrees important in a triangle. And by the way, what did triangles have to do with circles? Mm -hmm. Like triangles? Like, like, what did they have to do with like circles? Well, you'll, uh, have you ever heard of um, trigonometry? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, yes. Have you ever heard that trigonometry has something to do with triangles? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the, the angles. Have you ever, okay, the, yeah. uh, the symbol pi mm -hmm. is the connection between circles and triangles. Oh, really? And is not only like that, but a triangle is only part of a circle. Oh, because I thought, like, because we were taught, like, you know, pi is like that, that, like, you know, like, the ratio of, the, oh, really? Wait, wait, what is the... Okay, the... here's another example of that. Do you know that overall and on average, all over the world, mm -hmm. the distance between the source of a particular river at a particular point is always known as the source of the head of the river and also the emptying point into the ocean? Mm-hmm. Every river on Earth has a ratio between the straight line from the head of the river to the ocean and the actual path of the river. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? Is it, is it, is it pi? <laughs> it's pi. 
Uh-huh. It's, it takes 3.14159 times as long to get to the river, or to get the river to the ocean as it is from a straight line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And now that's a that's a mind-boggling thing to recognize. Wow. Okay, now here's the point. A long, long time ago, they were just still trying to figure that stuff out. Mm-hmm. But nowadays, look what we can do with mathematics. We put it. We put us on the moon. It's given us uh, modern computers. It's done all kinds of things like that. Mm-hmm. But computers themselves have gone from raw machine code to assemblers to compilers. To language systems, right. to uh, database, mobile and apps. That, yeah, and mo- well, the mobile apps are just <laughs> little things that um, right. require a lot of memory. Those those little apps, those mobile apps, we couldn't have put on a mainframe years ago because we didn't have enough memory. Mm-hmm. That in fact, almost everything we did in the early days was how fast, how little machine code and how little storage that it took. So your number one computer scientist on our team was a guy who could write the fastest code Mm -hmm. that ran in the short and the smallest space. Mm -hmm. Those two things are no longer a criteria anywhere. We don't care how much we're we're caring about uh, other issues other than how much memory our computer has. Right. Exactly. I mean, like now, nowadays, right? Like it, it's like automated. All this stuff is like you don't like the performance is not so much of an issue now, right? Because memory is cheaper and the, the hardware is just more powerful. Right. So yeah. I've got more memory on this laptop here, 16 gigabytes, than there was in all the computers in the world when I was in graduate school. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like times have changed. Like. And like now, you know, it's it's ultra competitive uh, now. That's why, like, you know, you, you have to. The expectation for us is, uh, you know. Oh no, the ultra competitive was always there. It was always there. Oh, I gotcha. It was always there. In fact, the uh, you can see that the ultra competitiveness is now not as much as it was, and here's the reason why. In those days, we were called experts, and we were paid as experts. I see. Now we're called computer nerds. And in often cases, not even paid at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now definitely like programmers have become like more replaceable, um, definitely because like back in your generation, they're specialists, like right? yeah, because uh, like a small handful of people were very specialized in these things. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, people uh, without degrees they go to boot camps to try and get a job. You know, they try to specialize in whatever the latest fad is. And so it's not so much of the special, like specialized theoretical uh, knowledge. It's now it's become more commonplace and all that. They know. even have languages now that are designed for playing games. Right. In those old days, we didn't even have subroutines or uh, the code written to oh, paint a screen. We had to do all of it ourselves. Oh, God. In fact, uh, a major step forward was when they put the drawing of a character into hardware. Okay. Right. The, the beginning, like, precursors, the video cards, I think, right? Like right. When, when we started with an ASCII code because the computers before that didn't have ASCII. Right. Oh, my God. Okay. So the ASCII coding system, then, we can take that bit for, like, an A and translate that into the letter A. Uh-huh. And that's done in hardware. Now, basically, that hardware has been moved to so- software in TTF files. Oh. But the logic of the TTF files was originally put into hardware so that we could just draw the letters. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now that you have a screen and a laptop that can actually put letters on your screen, mm-hmm. you still have to control the putting every letter on your screen. And remember, we had no graphics. The only thing that you could do was put letters and bars and things like that on the screen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you had to, if we were writing an assembly language, that means that we had to do all the routines for managing the screen into our own code. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. That, that sounds like, oh, my God. Okay, so now you can see why things got slow, but as we built up, we built up just like um, 
uh, Einstein can stand on the shoulders of Newton, uh-huh. every new product can be a platform for the next product. Right. And so now people can write, uh, 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 let, us, let us use the example of Super Mario or one of the really, really old original games and how much work it took, or even going further back, going back to Pong. You remember Ping Pong where you had to do the sliding yep. board like- and uh, you had to calculate the angle so that if you knew where the ball was going to hit and what angle it was coming from. Uh, and also take into consideration the motion because motion puts spin. And so, uh, if you're moving, if you've got the bar there, when you hit it, it's going, you know the angle. But if the thing is moving while you hit it, you have to calculate the trajectory of where the ball is going to go based upon the fact that the paddle was moving when it was hit. All right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So all of that had to be done in assembly language. Now, yeah. Pong can be done in three or four lines of code. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was first coding it, I didn't know how to handle time properly in a game loop. And there were times where the ball would go straight through the paddle. And I discovered what was happening was there was the, the frame immediately before it was right on the left side of the paddle. And because of the time lag, the next frame, it skips the paddle entirely. So there was no collision detection going on with the paddle. It just goes like, straight through the paddle. I was like, oh, my God. I can't imagine doing that in assembly. That that that's insane. That's <laughs> okay. So now you recognize that it's st- it's stages built one on top of the other on top of the other. So that means that with this industry, the kids that are graduating from college at the age of twenty two right now mm-hmm. have been learning things if they're at the right college mm-hmm. that they did not teach the thirty five year old. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, now the 35-year-old has fallen behind mm-hmm. because he's not keeping up with the uh, with the language. Now, mm-hmm. look at it goes from first it started with Pascal, mm-hmm. and I'm talking about Pascal as a as a teaching language. From right. Pascal, it went to Java. From Java, it went to uh, um, Oh, what's uh, the the oh. the common one? Ruby on Rails is the next word. Uh, uh, so one now, what happens is is that the actual line of code mm-hmm. follows every compiler since Fortran, because mm-hmm. Fortran was formula translation, which means you had an equal sign. Mm-hmm. So now most lines of modern code will have an equal sign someplace on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Normally it's variable, equal, and then you'll have some sort of either a line-coded function or a function. It's mm-hmm. the functionality or the functions mm-hmm. that have exploded. Mm-hmm. It's the standard okay. Line. And so once someone writes a function, no matter what language is in, that function that can do that can now be put into anybody's code, and nobody has to write that function anymore. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so the real art of a computer scientist is know what's, what tools are available to him uh-huh. so he can get her done really, really fast uh-huh. because he's got so many tools available. Yeah, exactly. And you know that, in, in fact, uh, uh, in, in financing, Mm-hmm. Uh, writing code for finance, you you are building on functions and formulas that were done many years ago. Horrible. I and you don't have to do those functions anymore. The worst part is those functions have production issues. That's when you find out that all the logic somebody stuffed into a 5,000 line stored proc. That's like the most horrible thing. Why would anybody ever keep that thing running? Because nobody wants to touch it. It's like this 20 year old. Nobody. <laughs> That's exactly why COBOL uh, code lasted as long as it did. Oh, my God. And so what they started to do, even for real time, mm-hmm. was to run that COBOL program and have its output and then have another program to read that output and reformat it for the screen and then send it out at HTML. Because nobody wanted to go into that COBOL. (laughs) 
Nobody wants to write. Yeah, that's, that's especially cool. banks. This is ba the banks were really stuck into COBOL. They eventually got out of it. The year 2000 was what got them out of it because COBOL didn't even have a date. Uh huh. Uh huh. Which meant that every programmer had to handle dates any old way he wanted to. <laughs> no. Oh, that's terrible. Now it's so easy because we've got a, a um, what do you, you call, uh, a convention. Mm -hmm. That convention is a double word floating point number mm -hmm. that, that is um, normalized at one second mm -hmm. or normalized nowadays, I think, at one day, mm -hmm. which means that all of the positive or all of the integer part is the day. And all of the um, uh, mantissa mm -hmm. is, um, or uh, uh, the decimal point, or the fraction, is the seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, by doing it, by doing it in or, or, or whatever, down to the uh, hundredth of a second. In other words, it has to do with the precision of the floating point number. Mm -hmm. that is only in dates that go out a million years from now or a million years in the past is when you start losing precision for your minutes and your seconds. Mm -hmm. But within the time frame of the next several hundred years, our floating point uh, number will give us a date and a time in that mm -hmm. double precision floating point number mm -hmm. For the next two or three hundred years, all the way back to 1900 or, or way beyond. I think, in fact, that uh, even if they go back 2,000 years, they can still uh, calculate it by the second. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. you know that the floating point number, the, the point floats depending upon the, uh, uh, the range of the, of the value. Okay. So now oh, all we need to do yeah. is develop a few simple mathematical skills about adding time and dates together. Because mm -hmm. you can say instead of uh, a year and a date, you can say, well, how many seconds is 10,000 seconds? Fine, here's a floating point number. I add that, and now that's a new date. And mm -hmm. so date is just so simple now. It's just all you have to do is just convert out of that floating point number, and there's only one algorithm to float to come wow. out of the floating point number into the representation on paper. Yeah, they, they actually have, like, a lot of, I mean, at least for Java, right? The the standard. I think in Java eight, they've already added a lot of libraries that smooth out like the time zone differences, and um, I guess like the date time format handling between um, like the DB timestamps, and then also application timestamps. So they've actually done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, a lot of the exactly. bugs that you normally get from like different time zones, it's completely smoothed out by the library. And a lot of the things that we have, like system clocks and all that stuff, it's already done, which is great. Right. Because I'm pretty sure, like doing this all by yourself would like take like a, a good a good chunk of time to get right. And not only that, but every other programmer has to do that too. And now your two methods don't fit together. Exactly. And that's the problem with COBOL. And the year 2000, they just threw up their hands. They didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Exactly. Partly because of the, uh, the century we didn't need to keep track of. Because remember, mm -hmm. we invented computers in the 1950s. We had 50 years, so why do we want to um, have a four-digit date when we can have a two-digit date? Okay. Well, and I then we come across to, oh, we got a change in century, and now we got a problem. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no, this is a fun discussion. Yeah, It's a good segue. I think, you know, like... I think now, yeah, like computers, they're, they're so much better. I'll just put it like that. Else I would not have been a programmer because there's like way too much to do. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so basically what's programming now is, is knowing how to put bigger and bigger blocks and pieces together to get a product. Mm -hmm. In the old days, our boxes were one line of code. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes your boxes is like the entire date system that's taken care of by other computers in other places, and the format of the date is such that date management is really easy now. So mm -hmm. if you look at it from that, that's, that happens with everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way that they manufactured automobiles in the very first, they all had to be done by hand, but never mind that. Go mm -hmm. back to guns. 
when muskets were built, they had to be built one at a time so that if you had two muskets and one had this broken and the other one had that broken, you just had two broken guns. Mm -hmm. But once you go into standardization, now you still have one good gun even though you had two broken guns before. Right. Yeah, okay. Are... But, exactly. So that's also the standardization of all of the various pieces, including how to manage states, how to handle windows, how to handle mice. How I had a rat. We didn't even... <laughs> the first mouse that I had was not even called a mouse. Mm-hmm. And it was oh, called yeah. a, rat, a rat because of the, of the rotating thing in it. It actually had a little wheel that had notches on it with a photo cell so that as the wheel went this way or went that way, you could calculate the, the movements of, of the rat. This was on a PDP-15 oh. computer. Oh, my God. That's ancient. That's, I'm pretty sure that's an ancient thing. I've never seen it, but I'm sure that's like an ancient piece of hardware. Yeah, I think I would. It would be a very good, um, um, uh, fun course to do. Is the history of the hardware, the history of computing. To have it done by someone who's actually been through that history. Wow. Yeah. That's in gotcha. Gotcha. And so, so yeah, part of what you were talking about of people getting fired at 35. Actually, I understand at the age of 71 how someone at the, in computer science at the age of 35 could be over the hill. Yeah. But, right. but he can get those skills back online now because everything that you want to learn yeah. is online with Code Academy, Khan, uh, many other places right like that. They're, they're keeping it up to date. You can yeah. go to MIT, get a computer yeah, science so degree at MIT online. <laughs> But yeah, so um, for next week, uh, what should I like uh, uh, focus on or like work on, like to keep examining, um, like I guess like Duca. All right, All right. Let's, let's put in one more thing. We're going to add the first and the third noble truth together, mm -hmm. so that you need to see what is suffering. You also need to see what is not suffering. Okay. So not? you start you start putting yourself in the states to where you can say right now I am not hungry for anything. Okay. Okay. Right now is good enough. I really like this moment as it is. Start looking. Okay. Start having those little nibbana moments. Okay. And start looking for start, those. Start looking for what it's like to be free from suffering. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Duca Naroda. Okay. Got it. Yes. Exactly. Okay. The third noble truth is the big one, Duca gotcha. Naroda. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start looking for that. Okay. Okay, you start playing with that, gotcha. which means that when the boss comes to give you suffering, you say, "Oh no, I'm going to take the no suffering route. I'm going to be free from suffering. I'm going to help him solve his problem." Gotcha. Okay. He used to think you were the problem. Now you're, you see, I'm not the problem now. I'm the solution to the guy's problem. I'm not suffering. Okay? Huh. Do that same thing with your dad. Mm -hmm. He's suffering. You're not. Gotcha. Okay. Let me take a closer look at that. Gotcha. Okay. Well, as always, thanks, Arado. I learned a lot. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I'll, see All right. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.